nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So today, uh, our presenter, and that's going to be uh, uh, Dr. Tomoko Borsa. Um, she comes to us from the University of Colorado Boulder. The topic of today's presentation is uh, FIB and scanning electron mic microscopy. And I will now uh, turn over uh, the presentation to um, Dr. Borza. Good morning. I'm, Col I'm in Colorado, so still 10 a.m., but good afternoon for those who are in the East Coast. Okay. So let's talk about nano characterization and fabrication using ion beam as well as beam as well as electron beam tools. The facility I'm supervising managing is Colorado Shared Instrumentation in Nano Fabrication and Characterization. So it's called COSIC. And as you who was supposed to be here today, but but most likely he couldn't make it. He's the director of CoSync. CoSync has two wings: one for characterization, one for publication. I'm I'm with a characterization facility. Okay, my talk goes this way. So start with nano. What is nano? And do the brief overview of characterization part and fabrication overview. And I wanna move to why we need it. The driving force for nanofabrication is definitely the semiconductor industry for IC integrated circuit fabrication. And in their industry, still the optical lithography or photon-based lithography is the main working force. But when it comes to nanofabrication, electron beam lithography, as well as fabrication using ion beam are sometimes beneficial. So I'm gonna cover those two topics. And at the end, focused ion beam instruments are very useful as a characterization tool. And hopefully I can show you some demo depending on how we are doing. Okay, so nano world. When we are talking about nano, mostly talking about length, not current or nano amp, we use it, the condenser, the, but we are talking about nano is nano, one nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. And the issue here is how can we see it? And how can we create nanostructure such a small thing? So nano structures are typically 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of the human hair. Human hair is about diameter of 50 to 100 micrometers. So for me, that's huge. Even though it's very thin hair, you can take a look at your hair then think about that's about 50 to 100 micrometers. Then imagine how small our nanostructures are. Okay, let's think about nanometer scale. And together I put the electromagnetic spectrum because it's easier for, I mean, important. It's closely related to the length scale. And typically our macro world starts about a millimeter. So everything we can see with our naked eyes are macro world, they belong to macro world. Micro world starts one millimeter and smaller. So human hair is in a micro world. The red blood cell is also, uh, red cells are typically 10 micrometers. So it's in micro world. Bacteria is about one micrometer. So it's in the middle of micrometer. And the virus, average size of virus is about 100 nanometers or 0.1 micrometer. So that is the beginning of nano world. Generally, nano world is considered to be something smaller than 100 nanometers. So 
virus 10 to 100 nanometers, that's nanowalt, and antibody is about 10 nanometers. There, the small molecule like glucose, the size is about one nanometer. Atoms are typically one angstrom or 0.1 nanometer. That's the size. Okay, let's compare with the EM spectrum. The wavelength in the visible light spectrum is about 300 nanometer to 700 nanometers. Okay, so we can see with a visible light about down to about a few micrometers, which is slightly larger than the wavelength of visible light spectrum. And in the nano world, no visible light, they are much smaller than visible light, therefore no color, even though they sometimes people put color on the SEM or TM pictures. Okay, so that's the height scale. And this is something exists in the world. Okay. Okay, this is brief history of characterization with microscopes. And I tried very hard to find the first optical microscope. That should be about 1600 AC. And the first demonstration of electron microscope transmission mode was in 1932. And from there, TEM, transmission electron microscope, is advancing constantly. So around 2006, the first ablation collected TEM appeared so that we are able to see 0.1 nanometer range with ablation collected TEM. Optical microscope will have it. The new kind of optical microscope is called the scanning laser microscope confocal, and in 2014, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for the super resolution fluorescence microscopy. So that is the, I think that's from the scanning laser microscope category. The TEM, the standard mode, normal mode of TEM, I think is that's the topic for the next week's seminar, is the mostly using the electron source instead of optical source. So that's electron with the electron source with a much shorter wavelength can see smaller items. So the, at least TM started in a similar geometry as an optical microscope, which is not the case, always the case right now. Okay. Then the first SEM, first commercial SEM, appeared on the market around 1965, which is about 30, more than 30 years later than the, or maybe 20 years, if I compare with the commercial TM, it's much later than the TM. SEM is scanning electron microscope, it's scanning based technique, it's very different from TM, normal mode TM, conventional mode TM. Okay, let's talk about ion beam tools. In 1959, Professor Feynman suggested the use of ion beams. But the actual ion beam tools appeared, didn't appear until 1978-ish. That's the first focused ion beam tool based on the liquid metal ion source. In 1993, FEI started saying the first FIB-SEM, dual beam system. So FIB by itself appeared in the market earlier, but by combining two beams, ion beam, focused ion beam, together with SEA capability, the FIB can take care of meeting part. Then SEM can be used observing what FIB just did. So the combination is very important for the instrumentation part there. So that was about end of the 20th century. Then in addition 
2007 first commercial helium ion microscope. The usually focused ion beam cruise has a gadium GA ion source. And, but ions FIB can be with any other ions. So I think this is the size developed helium, which is the noble gas, very small. So it has a different, the helium ion microscope can do different things than gallium based FIB. And also for the larger atom side, for more first emitting side, around 2012, first commercial plasma FIB using xenon atoms there. Okay. I wanted to include one more category <laughs> to this history. One thing is that STM scanning probe microscope, which is very different from electron microscopes or optical microscopes. But 1982 first STM scanning tunneling microscope was developed. In 1986, they got the Nobel Prize with the STM. Around 1991, first commercial SPM scanning probe microscope, including atomic pulse microscope, appeared in the market. So this is the brief history here. And today, my focus are ion beam, FIB area here. Okay, let's talk about nano characterization. So this is very similar to the three slides back or something. So macro, micro, nano world, what can we use to see those uh, items belongs to each world? So macro world, we can see with our eyes. Micro world, most of the time we can use optical microscope. And Nano world, you have to have a SEM, scanning electron microscope or transmission electron microscope. Okay, let's talk about non-publication little bit. And the size scale wise, I try to find at each length scale, something human made. So the head of a pin is about one millimeter so it's right there. The MEMS device, the typical, uh, the future length of MEMS device, it was last week's seminar topic. It's about 10 to 100 micrometer in size because it's MEMS is micro, okay? When it's sized down to nano world, it's called in a different name. So MEMS are typical in the, Microscope, sorry, that belongs to micro world. So that if you attended, attended last week's seminar, you remember the main tool for lithography was optical lithography. Okay, because it's 10 to 100 micrometer, it's a relatively easy to make devices in that range using the optical lithography. However, it comes down to Getting closer to nano world, the conventional optical lithography tools, such as mask aligner, would have a hard time producing one micrometer contact printer or mask aligner. It's okay down to one micrometer. Then after that, you may need a stepper or you have to use something else. The industry, semiconductor industry uses a different approach, but in the research world, universities or the national labs, what well, device is in the development, you have to change the design all the time. Then EB lithography or IB, ion beam publication, the convenient tool. The transistors nowadays, are in the range of 10 to 100 nanometer future size. That's based on gate length, typically. And one nanometer, the carbon nanotubes diameter, the smallest one is about one nanometer. 
Uh, one nonstrom, the thickness of graphene, no other 2D materials such as molybdenum disulfide, thickness is about the uh, should be the same as atomic length. So it's one angstrom uh, 0.1 nanometers. So this is related to nanofabrication or material fabrication, graphene and CNT, those are material fabrication. Okay, so for the MEMS device, optical lithography was great, but when you wanna make nano devices, sometimes or 80% of the time, optical lithography is not good enough. Okay, let me cover the semiconductor industry. It's formed around 1960. So it's relatively new because they have to wait until the fabrication of semiconductor devices become a viral business. The discrete devices are not a good market share. So in this currently industries, annual sales revenue has grown over 481 billion as of 1918. So I don't know how fast it grows, but 500 billion industry. And the most widely used semiconductor device in the history. And it's gonna stay this way for at least a while. The MOSFET metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, which was invented in 1959 at Bell Labs. This changed modern world a lot. MOSFET, 99.9% .9 of all transistors are MOSFET because we cannot have a computer without MOSFET. So the MOSFET device is estimated total of uh, 1.3 times 10 to the 22 MOSFET devices have been manufactured between 1960 and 1918. What am I talking about? Okay, so the MOSFET, when I think about MOSFET, I think about my computer CPU. So I checked my computer, current office computer, their Inspiron 3880 desktop, has Intel Core i7, and I checked the ID name is 10700. This one is based on Intel 14 nanometer technology, and this CPU, desktop computer CPU, contains approximately 3 billion CMOS, complementary MOSFET transistors. So that's how many MOSFET transistors you have you may have in your computer, okay? So three billion. And the MOSFET history or MOSFET scaling, the gate length was about 10 micrometer in early 70s. And the length, gate length or a process node is continuously going down till nowadays. That is actually, I'm very surprised at this because like, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, people are saying we cannot make transistors any smaller with the current technology, but they are st still doing. So the currently 14 nanometer technology is, is like my desktop computer is just, you know, consumable electronics. Computer is my regular computer, nothing special, no supercomputer or anything. And the latest one is about eight or seven nanometer technology. Then within several years, the size should shrink down to three nanometers. I don't know it's gonna happen, but we have, I think it's, we are very close to have a three nanometer MOSFET. Okay, let's talk about optical lithography. It's a recap from the last weeks. Okay, photon-based technique. So, of projecting or shadow casting. So, transferring the image on the mask, we make a mask on typically on the glass or a fused silica substrate. 
the mask make so it's digital. So dark area would be the chromium typically. So we image, so we project mask image onto the photo resist, put it on, onto the substrate of choice and mostly silicon for MOSFET. It is the most widely used lithography process in the man manufacturing of nanoelectronics by the semiconductor industry. So the industry uses optical lithography a lot. Okay. This is mainly due to the speed. You can transfer a lot of patterns in a relatively short time. Intel Core i7, my desktop computer CPU, is made on 300 millimeter or 12 inch wafer, silicon wafer. And the die size of my Core i7 is approximately 150 millimeter squared. So how many can we have? Approximately 400 CPUs can be made on one 300 millimeter silicon wafer. Okay. So that's a lot. Okay, the wavelength we use for pattern transfer is the fundamental limiting factor in determining the resolution of the optical lithography systems. CD is the critical dimension, K is the contrast and the lambda wavelength. NA is a numerical aperture. So historically, or still now, the mercury lamp we use as a light source. I think that's still the case. And the mark, this light has three particular wavelengths with a great emission power. G line, 436 nanometers blue, and the I line, 365 nanometers ultraviolet. Those are two important ones. And think about, okay, if you are making MEMS device, like 10 micrometer or 100 micrometer, depending on the design, those mercury Z line or I line, they should be sufficient, right? Much smaller the device you want to make. However, if you want to shrink the MOSFET, much smaller, 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 because the market wants to have a more computing power. So we have to have a more MOSFET devices within a limited space. So we have to make MOSFET devices smaller and smaller. So people started looking for a different light source, deep UV. So it's laser source and xenon fluoride, xenon chloride, Krypton fluoride, argon fluorine fluoride. So I think R ARF 193 nanometer. So that was the, I think that's the one Intel used to make, produce my core i7 CPU. But people want to have gate length smaller than 10 nanometers, so those guys are too large. So now the semiconductor industry is looking at extreme UV, also known as soft X-ray because it's getting close to the X-ray region. Wavelength of this particular light source, CO2 laser with a thin plasma, is 13.5 nanometers. Okay, small, good. But there are some issues, practical issues associated with that uh, as the wavelength goes down. In a deep UV time, okay, we couldn't use any soda lime glass anymore, so you have to switch to fused silica optics. And for some shorter length in the deep UV region, you have to switch to calcium fluoride optics. In a X-ray region, Absorption is too much. So you cannot use conventional transmission mode of 
pattern transfer anymore. So you have to use reflective multi-layers for the deep UV optical lithography or photon-based lithography. Okay, great. Semiconductor industry, they shrink. They, they are using different source so that they can make nano electronics. So can photon-based lithography do everything we want? Not really. Okay. So it's shrinking. This technology advancement is amazing. I didn't know I was using the CPU with a 14 nanometer node process. Okay, photon based lithography. Let's take a look at actual instrument. Each EUB extreme, extreme UV optical, uh, UV this. this Lithography system weighs 180 tons, takes 18 weeks to assembly, assemble the cost more than $120 million. And in 2020, only 31 were extreme UV lithography systems. Okay, the big semiconductor companies such as Intel, can buy those guys, but this is extreme UV or deep, even the deep UV lithography tools uh, mostly for industries, not for research environment. And this is the overview of lithography for nanofabrication. I'm just talking about conventional lithography techniques, so I'm not in. I did not include unconventional lithography techniques such as nano imprint. Okay. So there are two categories under conventional lithography indirect writing as well as direct writing. Indirect writing, optical lithography is, uh, well, optical lithography does not work well for nano fabrication. That's the reason why I didn't include here DUB, EUB, and the future X ray lithography or uh, indirect writing method. So that means, generally, means quick. You can transfer a lot of information with a limited time, shorter time. Direct writing method. EBL, electron beam lithography and nylon beam lithography or a fabrication using nylon beam, both belong to the direct writing. Direct writing, that means slow. There are some good things with the direct writing method, but the industry, semiconductor industry, cannot use electron beam lithography for everything because of its speed. That's why the industry stays with indirect writing method. Let me quickly cover, I wanna spend a decent amount of time on the electron beam lithography. It's used primarily for two purposes. This is for industry, okay. Very high resolution is required. Then they can use, so they can combine optical or photon-based lithography together with e-beam lithography. Because to make integrated circuit, you have to have so many layers, so many, even the lithography steps, multiple, many. So you have to, sometimes you can use, you can stick in one or two steps with an e-beam. And also fabrication of mask, EBL is very useful. EBL is very popular in research environment due to its flexibility. So when you are doing the research, you have to change the design depending on the previous processing feedback. So we need to constantly change design, which is not very feasible for optical lithography step publication. So, Flexibility, fabrication, and also fabrication of non-conventional devices such as qubit fabrication, EBIM should be useful. And since I said qubit, I have to check they are small enough, actually nano devices, yes. So this is the inside of IBM quantum chip. And 
you can see here the those smallest features in the qubit is about 100 nanometers. So, and the, this is just epsilon junction superconductive jumps, uh, the junk device utilizing superconductive material. So this must be, I think this is the, you know, good chance EV monitography was used for this one. IBM is such a big company, so I'm not 100% sure, but for, you know, but qubit uh, quantum tips are still under development, so they have to change the design constantly. So direct writing lithography method are okay. Okay, why do we want to use EB lithography for high resolution or nano fabrication? Let's compare photons and electrons. By the way, the photons are stress and just have energy. So visible wavelength in the middle of visible range is 500 nanometers and 200 is the UV, deep UV region. 10 is beginning of X-ray and 0 0.01 nanometer, that's the end of X-ray and going to the 0.001, that's gamma ray wavelength. So typically, deep UV, 183 nanometer is used. Still, okay, let's think about electrons here. Electrons are different. It's not the electromagnetic wave. It's a matter wave. So typical electrons in the SEM environment, Tungsten filament SEM environment, which is the very standard instrument. 30 kb, that electron has wavelength much smaller than nanometer. Okay. And the energy is much higher there. So typical, uh, the big e-beam writer should use 100 kb as an incident electron wavelength is really small. But my point here is even the regular SEM, conventional SEM can have, those electrons can have, electrons do have much shorter wavelength compared with the photons. This is the one reason why we can do, we can achieve much higher resolution using electrons. Advantages, of EB lithography, fine control of nanostructure futures that's based on diverse device technologies, lateral resolution 10 nanometers, placement accuracy 1 nanometer, and patterning field size 1 millimeter. So that's the limit. Yep. Flexible direct light, no mask required, no diffraction program. I should not, I should not mention about, I did not mention about diffraction limitation in optical lithography, but I include it here. Disadvantages of electron beam lithography, slow compared with direct writing method because you have to expose, it's serial writing. So you expose one area, you move to the next area, you move to the next area. So it takes long time if you wanna write 300 millimeter wave, it's gonna take forever. There's the effect, this effect proximity effect that can kill resolution. So it's not perfect. And of course, I, I think it's a pattern transfer process is required. This is, uh, this is true for optical lithography as well. However, this process of the pattern transfer process, this is mostly the post processing after lithography process. This can kill good resolution of EBL. Let's look at e-beam lithography process. You have a substrate, silicon or whatever of your choice and you have to 
uh, spin code E beam resist, which is different from optical resist, photo resist. And you start with CAD file instead of a mask. Then you expose E beam resist with a focused electron beam here. After exposure, exposed area changes physically or chemically, depending on the E-beam resist you are using. But then after exposure, it is still flat to under observation. Then you use the chemical to remove exposed area. I'm talking about positive E-beam resist here. Then you have a pattern in the resist. Okay, so I started with the CU University of Colorado, not the official logo, but one of the logos we have. And after exposure, chemically changed, or well, physically changed, PMMA, which way should I say? This is physically changed. If you use the PMMA, which is the popular E-beam resist, which is positive, E-beam actually, breaking down backbone of this polymer. So it's physical change, chemical change, I think somewhere in, in between. And this broken backbone, so the much smaller polymer size can be removed in a relatively strong solvent. So now you have a structure like this. And this you logo, it's about 1.5 by 1.5 micrometer in size, and the line width is about 50, 43 nanometers. Yeah. And this was made with the fridge tool. I think 30 kb tungsten filament this year. Okay, I said post-processing pattern transfer is required, so I wanna show you the typical process here. Uh, the for lift-off process, Copolymer PMMA double layer recipe is often used for positive resist. Developer is MIBK through isobutyl ketone and uh, isopropanol mixture. Then you start with a substrate and the double layers. After E beam writing and development, the exposed area, you lose it. Then after that, you put a metal thin film by evaporation or sputter coating one uh, or any other thin film deposition method and you remove resist. You have a purple tiny area with a metal that is, so I'm transferring the pattern from resist pattern to the metal pattern, which is not temporary, okay? The resist do not resist is just a temporary pattern for many cases. You have to transfer to the pattern in the metal, patterned metal or patterned substrate, which such as silicon. Okay. So to make this happen, those are the steps. So you don't have to <laughs> know every single step, but my message here is, this is the very simple process, but you have to take care of every single step right in order for the successful lift-off process, okay? So, so many steps, that's the message here, so that we can compare with the IBM publication data. And the resolution pattern, I think not many people have, have a chance to look at the how even pattern looks like. So I include it here. This is so old, but the left side is my CAD design. The middle part, this is after development, after exposure and after development. This is the optical microscope image. In the, diff, uh, in the diffraction mode, sorry, the dark field. And the right one is the gold dot arrays and with the SEM observation. 
this is how they look like. So when I have a spacing, center to center spacing, so the distance between one dot center to the next dot is 200 nanometers. And here I'm making dot arrays, so I use the dot dots, point dots. Okay, left one is 20 font coulomb, font is 10 to the negative 12, okay? So much smaller than nano coulomb, okay? 10 to the, but the coulomb, we use a very small unit here. In the top rows, spacing is fixed at 200 nanometers, and I'm just increasing the point rows from 20 to 200 point Chrome. And bottom row, my spacing is 150 nanometers, and I use the same 20 to 200 second. And this is after pa pattern transfer. And as you can see, spacing 150 nanometer to with a two point, 200 point Coulomb exposure didn't work very well. Didn't do good lift off there. Okay, so as I decrease the point dose, I can reduce the dot diameter. So the smallest one was about a little less than 30 nanometers. I'm talking about those structures are made with my tungsten temperament, ancient SEM, nothing special. But by using electron beam lithography, I can make 30 nanometer dots without having a very fancy e-beam lithography machine. So uh, the issue here with the EBL is proximity effect. Actually, when two dots are close to each other because of proximity effect, they cannot separate nicely. Okay. The developed pattern is wider than the scanned pattern, exposed pattern. And the main reason is the backscattered electrons. Backscattered electron detectors are bad guys for when it comes to the proximity effect in the EBL. I said I was using 30 kb instrument. If you want to reduce the proximity effect, you should use higher incident electron energy. 100 to 200 kb would be nice. And this is where the, the commercial dedicated e-beam writer uses, 100 kb or the 50 kb. 200, they don't use too much because it causes different issue, but 100 kb instead of 30 kb because it's less severe proximity effect with a higher instant energy. This is the second example for pattern transfer. Instead of doing the lift-off process, you can use the uh, etching. So in this case, EBM resist, different resist I used here is act as an etch mask. So you start same way, substrate, and you put the EBM resist and you do writing, developing, so you remove area exposed, that is still positive resist. And the next step, instead of depositing a thin film layer, you can do dry edge. Then you remove the resist, you have a, now you have a hole in the substrate. That's a different way of doing the pattern transfer. Again, this process involves so many steps. In this way, I was able to make smallest hole about 50 nanometer holes with a five font Coulomb point dose. Let's think about EV monitography in research environment, meaning universities. I think it's many fabrication facilities well, fabrication facilities should have mask aligner. It's a contact pr printer. This can be used for MEMS device fabrication. A simple mask aligner or contact printer 
it's a different name, cannot achieve 100 nanometer resolution, period. Because we are using the G line or I line, mercury, 400, about 400 nanometers with a refraction issue, you cannot make 100 nanometer with a simple mascarina. A simple SEM, like shown in the right picture, can be used as an e-beam lithography tool and can create about 100 nanometer holes or cylinders. That's the big difference. It's nice to have an electron beam writer dedicated system because it can do much more than a simple SEM-based E-beam lithography system. But think about the price. The price tag of electron beam writer is usually five to 10 times higher. Five to 10 times higher. Is it fair? Yes, than the SEM. And nano publication in research environment. Think about the E-beam writer is about 5 million up to 5 million, but compared with the EUB system, which is about 120 million data and huge tool with less flexibility, electron beam writer is a better tool for research environment because of its flexibility and the speed is not as important as in the production environment. So in the research environment, nanofabrication, tool could be electron beam lithography because we don't have to worry too much about the speed. Instead, we want to have flexibility. That's why the e-beam lithography is so popular in academic environment. So by far, direct writing method, BL is a good tool. And many and much more popular than ion beam lithography or fabrication with the ion beam, nano fabrication with the ion beam. Okay, finally, we are here, FIBSEM, the first focused ion beam scanning electron microscope instrument became available commercially in 1993. So it has two currents, one for like typically SEM column is top down, straight down, and the FIB ion source is connected in the sideways. Throughout the past 25 years, gallium FIB SEM have, is the dominated instrument, gallium ion beam. This is due to long lifetime as well as the robustness of the gallium liquid metal ion source. Even though we have helium ion, helium ion or xenon plasma FIB now on the market, still gallium FIB is the most popular focused ion beam instrument. Now, time to compare electrons and gallium ions. My message here gallium ion is huge compared with electrons. Okay, let's compare the mass. Electron mass 9.11 10 to the negative 31 kilogram. Tiny, but it has a mass. But the gallium ion is 1.16 times 10 to the negative 25 kilogram. So it's 30 10 to the five times larger, heavier than electrons. Okay, that's the major difference between electrons and gallium ions, heavy. So that's heavy, still tiny, but heavy ion beam interact with solid. Many things happen. I didn't cover electron solid interaction in this presentation but much more than electron solid interaction because of the ion has a nucleus. The number one, generation of secondary electrons. This is electronic interaction. So this happens during the electron solid interaction. Okay. 
we are detecting secondary electrons when we get the image with the SEM. And number two, polymerization, which is not so important here. Number three, sample surface sputtering. So iron, heavy with the charged material, impact the surface. What's going to happen is that can remove the surface atom by momentum transfer. Whenever it comes to momentum transfer, mass of the particle is so important. So heavy ions can do, can do surface sputtering. While electron solid interaction, surface sputtering does not really occur. That's the major difference. In addition, there are many things are happening there. And I'm not going to cover everything, but the important one is number eight. Ion implantation can happen. So that means gallium ion coming from the ion source interact with a solid, and gallium ion can stay inside at the surface. That's ion implantation. implantation. Okay, let's think about what can ion beam do. Number one, so three things, image, mill, deposit. The left one is imaging. So I'm using gallium ion as an incident beam and detecting secondary electrons. Okay, this is what, so this is very similar to SEM, secondary electron image, but because of the interaction, ion solid interaction is different from electron solid interaction, even though we are detecting the same secondary electrons, image looks a little different. The middle one is meeting. This is number three phenomena, surface sputtering. So heavy ion can remove atoms near the surface, sputter away. Therefore, you can create some holes. And right one, ion beam induced deposition. So we can locally flow smaller amount of gas and the, those gas molecules can be attached to the surface. Upon gallium ion interact hitting the surface, what's gonna happen is secondary electrons are generated. That energy of secondary electrons can modify the property of surface adsorbed gas molecule, then you can deposit some material for the CU buff logo. I believe this is the platinum deposition. So three things we can do. With ion, sorry, electron beam, you can do imaging and you can do electron beam induced deposition as well, but not meeting. This is a good example I found while I was looking for some good fabrication example. So think about fabrication of antenna. So you start with a membrane sub substrate, and again, we want to make small, tiny metal circular thing on the membrane substrate. This can be done by EBL or with a FIB. So the final result structure is the same, but the process is different. How many steps? Five steps for EBL, only three steps for FIB. So the process steps for electron beam lithography, substrate cleaning, spin coat, writing itself, Develop, development, metal deposition, lift off, six steps. I said five, but it's actually six. Ion beam lithography. You still need to clean the substrate, yes. Then you deposit metal, yes. Then do milling. Only three steps. Very simple. However, there are some issues associated with the ion beam lithography. So as I mentioned, EBL is more complicated process, more steps. More steps means more chance for something goes wrong. However, the final device behaved much better 
with the EBL method. For this case, it's a stronger plasmonic response with a better field confinement in the events. That's what the research group like a lot. This is due to the better structure quality with the homogeneous thickness of the metal structure and only moderate contamination, mostly of organic compound. EBL, that's EBL. Now, IBL, simple process, less steps. However, the final product, and then the antenna showed weaker plasmonic response. This is what they didn't want. This is due to lower structure quality, structure quality with uh, some thickness fluctuation within the metal piece there and strong contamination, both organic and inorganic including implanted ions from focus beam, in this case, the gallium ion implantation. Implantation can change electronic structure of the material. Okay, so most of the time, resolution-wise, EBL and IBL is about the same, but nano device fabrication using ion beam has limited applications because of the implantation contamination issue for gallium. So how about different ions? Yes, helium ion microscope. If you use the helium beam, it's helium is a gas. So it's less implantation issue. Even though there are some issues still there of helium implantation, and xenon is also noble gas. So it's less contamination issue. However, xenon plasma also can change the surface properties. Not so much with um, contamination, but can damage the crystal structure. So good thing and bad things for both cases, but when you want to make devices, you have to think, okay, which do you want to use? Okay, I want to show you some nanofabrication examples, nanofabrication using IOBIM examples. Okay, this is, this happened in, um, in our facility. So one group, this group in physics, they wanted to modify the commercially available atomic force microscopy probe. So it's, you see those small pieces, those silicon pieces, and the longest, uh, so that's about five millimeters by two millimeter in size. And I hope movie works. Okay, I'm talking about, they are trying to modify the tiny, tiny, piece sticking out from the five millimeter piece. So using the ion beam, so they are making some cuts. This is the movie. So they are trying to change the mechanical property of this cantilever by removing or adding some materials. So now it up. So they made a big hole in the middle of the cantilever to change the mechanical property, means resonance frequency okay, of this cantilever. And they are still making those legs thinner so that the cantilever works in the way they want. Okay, this is uh, this is in the field of biomedical. So this is one example. When you want to make nano devices or, or modify existing nano device in there, and it's not big silicon wafer or anything, it has a completely different shape. 
And fortunately, they don't have to worry about contamination by iron plantation for this case, because they are interested in mechanical properties, not electronic properties. Okay. Different example here. So they have a metal tip for laser application in order to improve the coupling, coupling efficiency of this one. I'm not optics person, so it's very hard for me to understand what, what they are trying to improve, but by but this is by so they have a this tip gold made with gold by adding those lines using the the fib, they can improve the device performance. Okay. For this case, the substrate or the sample you wanna pattern fabricate is not flat. So EBL is extremely difficult. The fib is okay. Fib is more flexible in this respect. So this is the different example when ion beam fabrication is useful. The last example here, imagine you have a crystal with a new material, not so well known, but it's so new. You have a millimeter size or even smaller size crystal, single crystal. Okay, you wanna check, if you wanna study about this new material, single crystal, you wanna make a special device, but because of the crystallographic nature of this, you wanna cut the slab with a specific orientation. How to do it? The fib can do it because we can polish millimeter size crystals. It's so difficult. So instead, you can use fib and create a slab and remove it and mount it on the prefabricated device structure. And you can test that device to determine the material property of this new material. So, so I showed some examples happening around the campus here when the fib fabrication is useful. Instrument looks like this. So what we have is a dual beam system, electron beam, gallium, ion beam system. Electron beam is thermal field emitter. That means the field emission SEM. So it's better than tungsten filament SEM. EDS detector, sorry, attached the deposition. We can deposit platinum, gold, insulator, which is SiO2, and also water assisted deposition is possible. It's very useful to do the cross sectional viewing after ion milling. Omni probe, micro manipulator is attached. And this kind of instrument is very popular for TM sample preparation, site specific TM sample preparation, and also patterning. FIB is extremely useful characterization tool for two reasons. One is you can create cross sectional wall, then you can check it with PSM. The left one, left figure is the example for that one. So from the top, you see something like those spherical things are raised there, but you can check what's going on underneath. And also the TM sample preparation. So inside fib chamber first, you wanna put platinum in the area you wanna cut off the slab, okay? So you remove the material from four ways, okay? Now you bring in the omni probe, micro manipulator, and attach the tip to the slab and remove it. You have a 10 micrometer by five, micrometer slab, then you can mount this tiny slab onto the TM half grid. Okay. You can connect and detach the micro probe. 
then now okay you have to make this rub thinner thin enough suitable for tm observation which is 100 nanometers or 10 nanometers depending on what you want to do so this process is useful for optimization defect analysis tool qualification or the failure analysis so tm sample preparation site specific tm sample preparation FIB is a must have tool so actually semiconductor industry uses fib a lot for this purpose this is from yesterday's session the user was the same group modifying it uh, AFM tip was used in this instrument yesterday, so I have a leftover picture there. So this is typical UI. Let me explain what we are looking at. So this top left window is electron beam in secondary electron detection. So this is the typical SEM image. Okay, top left is a SEM image. Top right would be the ion beam image. So that means ion beam in secondary electron out. I don't have any detector to detect secondary ions. So what I'm detecting is secondary electrons using the same detector for both top two. It's always the same, have to find the sample. Well, while you're doing this, Tomoko, what did you say the cost of this this instrument was approximately? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't mention the price range of the focused ion beam tools, but typically two million. Oh, is that all? Take that I out of one twenty million. It's much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take that out of petty cash. It's all good. <laughs> so for the new like the multi-beam multi-plasma multi-ion source FIB is about 5 to 6 million nowadays but the regular gallium ion FIB is 1 to 2 million I think this is the typical working environment. So working distance is about the working distance of the eucentric height should be about five millimeters for this instrument. So this is electron beam, electron beam pole piece. And this is the ion beam pole piece. Right now, I'm looking at sample top down with the electron beam. Okay, for meeting environment, I want to have an ion beam hitting perpendicular to the surface. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that means I have to tilt the stage. Ah, tilt, tilt it towards the ion beam? Yes. So I'm, first I'm going to tilt small amount. So I'm looking at the dust particle on the top of the So while the tilt angle is changing, electron beam is still hitting the same particle. Okay. So now, because of the geometry of this instrument, ion beam is hitting perpendicular to the sample surface. Is ion beam ready? Yes, ion beam is ready. Okay, what is the So ion beam condition, I use 30 KB, 93 picoamp for navigation purpose. Let's see if we can get the image here. Okay, let me pause it here. So, I didn't move the stage. I just switched the imaging mode with the ion beam mode. Then two beams hitting about the same location.
So, electron beam image is from the angle. Okay. Ion beam image. Okay, so from top down, this particle sitting on that surface looks like this, but from the with the electron beam, it looks different because your your view is not from the same angle. Okay. That, but important to find the G height hitting two spots. I'm going to create the, some cross-sectional view here. I'm going to have meeting 10 micrometer. Okay, so this, uh, if I ask instrument to remove 10 micrometer by two micrometer by two micrometer with the current condition, it says it's gonna take 48 minutes. That's too long. So I'm going, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna increase ion beam current to 2.8 nano amp. That's about right. Actual measurement is a three nano amp there, and it's gonna take minute and a half, less than two minutes. So let's check it first. This is the median effect. <laughs> so you wanna, with the ion beam fabrication, if you want to do it seriously, you want to minimize exposure to ion beam as much as possible. Let me start with a minute and a half. So I hope I can create some cross-sectional view on Kappa here in short time. While meeting is going, it is possible to observe with a electron beam, however, it's a lot is going on, image is noisy, and I usually don't wanna run. I, I wanna have a scanning going now. We can wait two minutes. So the, after two minutes, meeting is done, so I have a hold there. Oh, wow. You can see the hole. So this is the hole. Is, is, that the electron beam, is that the electron beam we're looking at right there? Yes, so I create the cross-sectional wall with a... Yeah. The issue of the message here is you can make, you can create cross-sectional wall to look at. This is not the whole, but what we are interested in the cross-sectional wall. And with the, uh, sorry. You're, you're trying to get a cross-section of it, right? And yes, so here, mm -hmm. ideally, I can see the nice view there. This is the cross-sectional water area, and I removed the material here. But ah. since I didn't remove wide direction enough, it's very shallow when you look at it. So if I remove more, you can see deeper. And when you see with the ion beam, you can see copper grain so well because the ion beam has a stronger channeling effect. So depending on the crystallographic orientation, one orientation, ions can go deeper, which create whiter area in some areas because of orientation. 
ions cannot go too deep. That can create darker area. That is channeling contrast. So I'm going to start tilting. Okay. The particle location is not moving, so that's it. I'm going to tilt to 52. So the beam is, electron beam is still hitting the same spot here, even though I, my tilt is changing. Now I want to have two beams hitting at the same spot. It's the same procedure. I'm going to turn on ion beam. Okay, so it's slightly off. So I'm moving the particle using the beam shift, not the stage. That means I'm going to stop here when I go back to Electron beam image. Okay, two beams hitting approximately the same area, same spot. So I use the beam shift to align two beams here. Instead of cross section circle, good. You can make smaller one. Micrometer. 0.5. How long does it take? Four minutes. So I will increase to 93 picom. Yep. So I'm moving the stage now. Gotcha. So it's in the middle. And let's check with ion beam once before I start scanning. No more particle. Different particle there, but that's okay. So let's do the hole there. Actually, a link here. The shape I'm making now is. Outer diameter, two micrometer, inner diameter, one micrometer, and the Z depth is about 0.5. And this is calibrated for silicon, so it should be close to 5.5 micrometer. The condition, beam condition I'm using is ion beam, 30 kb, 93 picoamps, my aperture. Is getting larger, so it's maybe actually larger beam now. Please wait for additional 34 seconds. And this is the hole I made. Oh, cool. Not too bad. <laughs> Yes, slightly moved, but it's if we can look at both image without moving too much or you know where meeting is going, mm -hmm. we use the electron beam a lot to check what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you know to make small hole, it's very convenient. All right. Well, this is fantastic, Tomoko. I hope <laughs> okay. Good thing is, okay, at least I was able to show you a hole. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you made it right now, right real time, right now, right? That's awesome. Yes, That's yes right now. So that, you know, if it's, you know, pre-made structure, I should have much better. Um, no, but it's okay. This is, this is, but, I made, but I didn't have time today. No, no, this is fantastic. Thank you. You've shared an, a tremendous amount of information. I think hopefully people are... Uh, you know, we're uh, 
learned a lot. I did. All right. Um, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Boris. I really appreciate your uh, helping us with our with our net series, and uh, uh, I, I, this is a an outstanding tool to have on our on our network. And uh, we really appreciate. Uh, it's the first time I ever actually saw one operate, so it was really cool for me. I don't know about anybody else, but oh. very cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay.